I was at this Mayor of Mayor Falls. This time I'll call the meeting of the Marshall City Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a, uh, like, first off, I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. We do have an agenda before us. Are there any corrections to note at this time? If not, we're operating under that agenda. The first item would be a consider the minutes of our last meeting that was held on September 12th. The council does have the minutes. Are there any corrections? If not, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion by John, seconded by Amanda to approve the minutes as they have been presented. We'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. So the, um, on the agenda, agenda item number three is not an award of bid. So we will move that down to the first item of new business, okay? That's, if that's, everybody agreeable to that? So three goes down the first item of new business. We're on agenda item number two, though, and this is to consider the award of bids for rock salt for the street department. I'll call on Jason Anderson, Director of Public Works, City Engineer, to present this agenda item. Thank you, Mayor. Um, proposals were received for 500 ton of rock salt for the street department on September 1st. We received five bids, with the low bid being provided by Blackstrap Inc. of Neelai, Nebraska. $90.24 per ton, a total of $45,120. The street department budget includes $45,000 for the purchase of uh, road salt this year and $8,500 for uh, any sand that we would mix with it, but we are not um, ordering sand. So we have room in the budget for this purchase and we would recommend to award. Okay, thank you, Jason. Are there any questions for Jason? The only question I have, Jason, is, and just for information, but in 2021, we got 250 tons, last year 350 tons. How come, just why are we jumping the 500? Yeah, it, it's all just conditions based. We did use quite a bit of uh, salt last year due to the, the way the winter was. Uh, we only order what we need to replenish our supply, and in prior years, we've just needed less. Okay, thank you. Steve? Mr. Mayor, so Jason, the question I have is, do we... What does the average cost per year cost, and does the DOT get a better deal than we do? And if so, is there a state way to buy salt? I mean, I was looking at this before, and according to last year, it was 80 some dollars per ton of number seven rock salt for the state through DOT. Well, if they're getting $10 cheaper, why don't we get that deal? You know, I don't have a great answer for you at this point, Councilman, but that's something that we can look into. If there's an alternative way to purchase through a state contract, we can certainly look. And it's Neely, Nebraska. Don't say me lie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Just because I lived there for a while in Nebraska, not Neely. So you have the recommendation. What is the wishes of the council? Move approval. Second. Craig, seconded by Steve. Discussion? Discussion, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We'll move then to the items on the consent agenda, which we'll bring up on the screen at this time. And they include consider the approval of a raffle permit for Ducks Unlimited, consider the approval of a raffle permit for United Way, consider the approval of the temporary on sale liquor license for Marshall Area Chamber of Commerce, consider the approval of a temporary on sale liquor license for SMSU Game Day Roundup versus Moorhead, consider the approval of a temporary on sale liquor license for SMSU Game Day Roundup versus Sioux Falls, consider the approval of the temporary Sunday liquor license for the gambler for New Year's Eve. Consider the request of Prairie Home Hospice and Community Care for the Light Up the Night Parade on Friday, November 24th. Consider the renewal of the Safety Management Service Agreement with MMUA. Consider the authorization to declare vehicles as surplus property. Uh, the declaration of use restriction for Independence Park as part of the 
Minnesota DNR Outdoor Recreation Grant, and then finally consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. Is there any item on the consent agenda any member of the council wants removed for separate discussion? Approve. Second. Motion by Steve, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. We'll move then to the first item of new business, which was agenda item number three. This is the intersection control evaluation for the intersection of Susan Drive and US Highway 59 Frontage Road. Once again, I'll call on Jason Anderson, City Engineer, Director of Public Works. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the intersection just east of uh, Maine and Susan is uh, kind of Susan Drive on a frontage road that goes to Walmart and Harbor Freight. There's that four-way intersection. Um, it's quite a busy and wide street area there, and there's numerous travel lanes in, at each leg of the intersection. It kind of creates maybe a little bit of a, a hazardous uh, condition for the cross traffic trying to get up toward the light. Um, it's further troubled by the free left turns that come in off of Highway 59 in towards Harbor Freight that um, make it a little tricky to navigate. Our uh, engineering budget for this year had uh, $30,000 included in it for evaluation of this intersection for possible uh, layout improvements. So city engineering staff met with PIT to discuss um, both on August 14th and then uh, today prior to this meeting to discuss the proposals that we received from SEH and Bolton and Bank. Um, after doing review of the submitted proposals, um, we'd recommend awarding a contract to Bolton and Bank in the amount of $33,773.85 to perform this evaluation. Um, this will include an intersection control evaluation, uh, a formal report that is, accompanies a traffic count and other um, analysis to help justify um, and identify any possible safety improvements. So staff would recommend that we um, award that and um, PIT recommended to award it as well earlier. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Jason. Uh, any input from the Public Improvement and Transportation Committee? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We, we did discuss this earlier this evening or this afternoon in our PINT meeting and um, we're in favor of it. And it was, a, it was a good bid, there were two bids received. And it was a good bid from Bolton and Mank and, and uh, They've uh, done a, a good job with us on our traffic stuff in the past, so it was unanimous to recommend approval. Okay. Questions the council has? If not, you have the recommendation from staff and the Public Improvement and Transportation Committee. I would entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number 15 is the Tree City Emerald Ash Bore Plan and the update on the grant applications. I'm gonna call on Preston Stensrud from our Parks Department who has been uh, working with the Emerald Ash Bore um, grant application as well as our, our management plan. And the management plan really has been in place for our a number of years, um, and of course the detection of emerald ash borer occurred several months ago in Marshall. Preston? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, tonight, just wanted to come and give uh, kind of update information um, on kind of um, where we're at with emerald ash borer, some funding possibilities to um, alleviate uh, um, the issue or help uh, I don't know that I'll slow it down, but uh, eradicate it from our community maybe quicker. Um, ultimately, without um, continued treatments, um, every ash will be gone eventually. Um, but the first thing I kind of want to start with is many, um, maybe some of you don't know that um, the um, city of Marshall is what's called a tree city um, by the Arbor Day Foundation, which means we meet four criteria. Um, we spend $2 per capita on tree care. We have a tree care department, we have tree ordinances, and then we have a proclamation um, declaring Arbor Day 
um, within the city of Marshall. Um, I think uh, we're in our, we're just in the application process again. I think this will be our eighth year um, doing that. Um, just noting that, uh, you know, our care and uh, the importance of trees in our community, not only in our um, private properties, but in public properties as well. Um, so just a, just kind of a um, informational for you guys on that. Um, next on the Emerald dashboard, I'm sure um, maybe some of you guys get questions on this too. Um, I get them quite regularly um, from people wondering, you know, should we just cut down all of our ash trees now? They look healthy, they still look fine. Um, or, you know, what's the right thing to do? Um, and there's really some choices people have to make. Um, whether they're committed to that tree long term, I would say it's definitely worth treating. Um, there's a product called Arbor Mectin. Um, it's 99% effective. Um, you would drill holes like every eight inches around the um, bottom of your tree um, with a certified applicator. You can't buy this chemical, um, you know, just go to the store or anything. You'd have to have a certified person um, do the application. Um, preferably um, spring to, you know, midsummer would be the best. Um, we're kind of out of the treatment window now um, for this season. Um, but that is definitely a possibility. You get two to three year um, efficacy where the chemical will stay active in the tree. Um, it can also help um, trees that are infected or known to be infected. If you have a 30% dieback or less, the tree can actually recover after applying this chemical. Um, the other side of things, if you have a lot of ash trees in your yard, um, you maybe want to start figuring out how to um, budget appropriately. Maybe you want to take one out a year and treat the rest and just slowly kind of um, start planting new trees. But um, the situation is different for everybody, but there's definitely options. We're glad to help um, explain those in further detail if people have questions. Um, um, so. On the city side of it, um, as of today, we still have 1,732 ash trees on public property. Um, so we are applying for some grant funds. We did the, it's called the Relief um, Grant through the um, Minnesota DNR. Uh, we submitted an application last week for $329,000. There's no match, there's no in-kind match, there's no nothing, you just get the funds if you're awarded. Um, which will be the first time the DNR has offered a grant like this. Um, we would use this particular grant to um, remove some ash trees along um, right-of-ways. As you remember, two years ago we did um, ash tree removals and plantings specifically in the parks. Um, so this one would focus more on right-of-ways. And then this is looking for kind of that uh, the um, lower income types um, property stuff that they'll give some funding back. So we're offering, we would offer a reimbursement um, if they had their ash trees removed. They could also plant trees. Um, and we proposed a two to one match. So for every tree removed, we'd plant two new trees. If for some reason the property owner doesn't want two trees, we'd take the one extra and put it on city property somewhere. So we still maintain that two to one. Um, we also have some funding in there um, for people if they want to get certified to be like a tree inspector, a tree steward um, through the U of M program, um, reimburse, reimbursement for that, um, and buying more tree watering bags. I get questions all the time on the green bags around the trees. Um, they basically hold 20, 25 gallons depending on how big you buy, and they waters the tree slowly over eight years, or eight hours. Um, very high success <laughs> rate. Um, with this hot summer, the 226 we plant last fall, I think we have eight that um, didn't make it um, with no rain. So um, it's worked out really good. Um, so that kind of t takes care of that one. And then I'm also working on one, um, almost finished, that'll be due next Tuesday. Um, that's called the shade tree, specifically for tree removals and new plantings that will go back into the parks, um, focus on park areas, library, fire hall, um, some of those kind of out by the arena, um, amateur sports complex. Um, right now I'm proposing to take out 75 more trees in the parks. We still have 372. Um, but as part of this grant, this first one, this relief grant, you can actually get reimbursed to treat them. 
um, and your staff time is reimbursable too, which is also the first time the DNR has offered that. So, um, so we're kind of kind of do that preservation of treat some, remove some, and eventually our our um, gap will get a little smaller. So, um, but with the shade tree, it would be strictly removals, moving removing 75 more trees, and I'm proposing to plant 200 new trees um, because there's no in kind or cash match. Um, we would have it all done by contractors because um, city staff time is not eligible as a reimbursement in that particular grant. Um, so basically we just get all the work done by through the bidding process. Um, we have three years to complete both grants um, and these grants are gonna be coming out each year um, for the next round too. So if we don't get them, we'll continue to keep applying. Um, the funding's there, I think between the both grants, they have like $16.8 million in funds available just in Minnesota. So, um, and it's gonna be very costly and uh, of course change the landscape of our community. Um, not only public, but private, people's backyards, um, everywhere. So um, with that, I think I'll just take any questions or if you, if you guys got them, so. Um, I'll start a um, couple, couple points. The uh, first off, Thank you for your work on this and for your grant application. This was, uh, as you said, will certainly change the, the tree canopy and the landscape within the city of Marshall. So careful planning about how that happens uh, so it's not as dramatic as it could be if it's all, if they all die at the same time. The, um, so it's good planning. So thank you for the work that you've done mm -hmm. on this grant as well as the past ones that the city has received. The, um, when you mentioned the, the treatment of, of option, it, maybe go into a little more detail for the public that the, um, this is a restricted use uh, of product, people need to be licensed, and, and specifically how, how uh, the city would uh, address treatment and who would do it on both public right-of-ways as well as parks. Okay. Yep, I can do that. Um, so like you mentioned, the arbormectin, or it's a chemical called emamectin benzoate, um, is a restricted use. You have to be a licensed um, pesticide applicator uh, in the, with the state of Minnesota. Right now there's um, two people or two contractors certified in Marshall to do this. Um, that the uh, private residents can certainly call to do this application. Um, they have their license, insurance, all that stuff. Um, and if it's on right away, we would still encourage just like maintaining your sidewalk that the resident would um, pay for the treatment of that tree. Um, whereas in the public area, not the right away, but the parks, um, we have ordered an injection system and the chemical um, and I'm, I got certification to do it. So we'll be treating some in the parks as well, but we're not gonna go on private property and do anything like that. So, um, but there is also other chemicals like soil drenches, just not nearly as effective. And if you have a large tree, it's probably almost not effective at all. So um, really this is the chemical um, of choice and it has, you know, proven success, so. <clears throat> and um, my last question on the, in the grant application with the replanting and the species that are identified of trees, the, uh, um, that's possible to edit that and uh, make some additions or deletions on that list over time? Yep, it's just strictly a list of um, stuff that would be available to plant. Um, and if, if new trees or new um, cultivars become available, or it doesn't mean, you know, if there's, there's some on here that don't necessarily even do that great that I probably wouldn't plant, but it's still, uh, they'd just like to see what your options are. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions? No questions, I'll just um, give a little input. I had my trees treated, oh golly, six weeks ago already, and it's not, without promoting anybody, it's not horribly expensive. And I think it's every other year is what he told me. Yep, they say two, and uh, if your tree's still looking healthy, you could potentially get to the third, but uh, I would just, to keep it simple, I'd just do every other year. You know, it's really actually very painless for the homeowner. It's a phone call and I didn't know when the guy did it, I just noticed a ribbon on my tree. So and I will. I, I hopefully will have shade for years to come. But something you have to continue to do. Yep. Every, every two years. Yep. Yep. I, I have some friends up in the cities. They've been treating theirs now for 12 years. Really? Every other year, and they have had no loss. Their neighborhood has lost trees. They have not lost theirs. Mm -hmm. 
So they kind of sold me when they said they've been doing it for 12 years. Yep. Or six years, tw six times 12 years. They say the it's 99% effective. So, I mean, it's pretty good chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Your tree's going to stay. And, you know, the another big question we get is, is it worth it? Well, it's hard to put a value on what your tree is worth to you and the shade and how long it took to grow and all that. So it's correct. Everybody's personal preference yep. might be different. So. I just use the example of I will never see trees that big again, so I don't want to lose mine. Yep. Yep. That's all I, that's how I did mine. Other questions? If not, this was just information, yep. so thank you, Preston. Thanks, Preston. We'll move then to the next agenda item, agenda item number 16, consider the amendments to the personnel policy manual. I'll um, ask Sheila Dubbs, our human resource director, to address this agenda. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, there are three categories of amendments for your consideration this evening. Um, six of the policies require amendments to comply with new Minnesota laws that were passed during the most recent legislative session. Um, many are technical amendments, such as title or department name changes, and then there are four additional policy revisions being recommended to clarify confusing language, um, update per diem rates, or to mo more closely align with the League of Minnesota Cities uh, model policy language. I did place a few notes in the draft version of your packet that explain why some of the particular revisions are being recommended. Um, for instance, in the first revision, policy number 1.9, um, that note reflects that the amendment is needed to comply with a new Minnesota law. I will be removing those notes for the approved policies um, that are approved this evening in the manual. Um, there was one technical revision that was inadvertently cut off in your packets. Um, that's for um, the last one on the, the technical revisions, 12.5. Um, that is a mobile device policy, um, and that is just a simple title correction. I have crossed off city clerk and instead put uh, the finance director stays for that one. And unfortunately, that cut off in your packet, so it's not in there. Um, I do have a copy of that page with me if anyone would like to review that, but it is just a simple cross out of the city clerk title. Um, the policies that required the most change were in the drug-free workplace chapter. Um, both the general policy and the policy that applies to the CDL holders required significant revision to come into compliance with the new Minnesota law. Um, our policies for drug and alcohol continue to prohibit an employee from being under the influence of drugs or alcohol, including cannabis, while working. Um, there is a comprehensive section also in the policy that identifies prohibited con conduct. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, that did not change except for it added the cannabis products. And that's on page 83 in your packets. Um, our policy manual follows as closely as possible the League of Minnesota Cities recommendations, which have been reviewed by their attorneys. Um, if the council approves the amendments this evening, I'll also update the cover page and the table of contents to reflect all of the approval dates. I have not done that yet. Um, the personnel committee did meet on September 12th. Um, they had considerable amount of time reviewing all of the proposed changes, um, and there was unanimous approval to bring these to the full council for consideration. So with that, rather than reviewing each policy, um, I think I would just entertain any questions on specific policies. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Any input from the personnel committee? We, uh, When we met, we did talk about it, and all the changes were coming into compliance with a lot of the state stuff and there wasn't any controversy, we recommend that we go forth with this. Are there any questions for Sheila? If not, is there a um, motion for the approval of the recommended changes? I would move that. A second. Motion by Steve, seconded by Amanda. Discussion? <clears throat> if not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. The motion does pass. Okay, so agenda item number six, number 17 is uh, Halbert Road reconstruction project. We have a change order number six, the final change order and the acknowledgement of the final pay request. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this was a, a 2022 project actually that we kind of carried over and had to deal with some um, 
final project items and then some paperwork things with our contractor. But we are here to close this project now formally. You've got the final reconciling change order as well as the final pay request. Uh, final payment in the amount of $11,227.07. Uh, with the final reconciling change order taken into consideration, the project came in under budget by $19,302. Uh, staff would recommend to approve the final change order and the final payment. Any questions? So moved. Second. Motion by Steve, <laughs> seconded by Jim. You're discussion? The only discussion would be it, we have a good product, so it's a good project. <clears throat> yes, we think it turned out great. Yep. With that, uh, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number 18 um, is the 2023-2024 property and casualty and liability insurance. Uh, we'll ask Carla Drown uh, to address this agenda item. Thank you, Mayor and Council. The insurance renewal covers the city, MMU, and library. I'm going to direct you to your attention to the um, attachment in the council packet, the insurance premium comparison. This document lays out the premium that we paid last year. The renewal costs for the same coverage and the premium coverage that staff is recommending this evening. Based on the advice from North Risk, the city budgeted for an increase of 5% for the 24 budget. The premium did come out for L L the, just the LMCIT coverage of a 9% increase. Staff are recommending the change to the current coverage. This change is to the LMCIT coverage and it would be for the deductible structure. Currently, the city has a $25,000 per occurrence, $50,000 aggregate, and a $2,500 maintenance. The recommendation is to go to the $50,000 per occurrence, $100,000 aggreg $100, aggregate, and $1,000 maintenance for a savings of $74,969 in the premium. That is spread over a multitude, multiple options up on that premium. The past 10 year claim history indicated that the per coverage and the aggregate were not met except for in 2022, and that was due to a wind storm that we had. So based on that information, we are recommending that change. The equipment breakdown is the other area that we are looking at a change in, and that is through Cincinnati. That is locked in at a rate of 58,491 for one more year. There are additional locations that the staff have reviewed and are recommending to add coverage there. The current coverage is for 27 locations. And remind you that this is for MMU, the city, and the library. We currently have approximately 170 locations just under our property coverage alone. So it covers very few of our properties. So in reviewing that, MMU decided to stay with the current locations for this insurance coverage period and the staff are recommending adding six additional locations. Um, at this time, we are waiting for, on Cincinnati to give us an adjusted premium. You will see that under the recommended, it states that there's 73,857. That was what Cincinnati recommended for additional locations, and there were um, addition, 51 locations, additions. So we are, um, in comparison, we're asking for six locations, so we're um, hopeful that it'll be just slightly over the 58,000 that we are currently under. Um, now, I'm gonna, at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our city insurance agent, Joe Larson from North Risk Partners, to help ask, answer questions and explain anything else. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Council, Mr. Mayor. Is there any questions at this time? Help me understand the location clause. I mean, what does that mean? Because that's $20,000, that's a lot. Yeah, um, so as Carla had stated, there was only 27 locations listed on the current policy. After review by uh, me and EJ and Carla, it was determined that there were several key locations that were missing. 
Um, to give you a little bit of an overview, and I don't want to get into claim scenarios because I could get pigeonholed into something, and it all depends on the circumstance, of course. But um, for one example, the liquor store was not listed on the um, equipment breakdown policy. And what equipment breakdown policy covers is sudden and accidental uh, failure to any of the mechanics, so refrigeration equipment, um, compressors, those types of things would all fall under there. So um, after review of all the locations, there was key locations we needed to get added. Um, I wasn't comfortable choosing which locations should and shouldn't be added, so we had Cincinnati go ahead, quote, every location that was on the League of Minnesota Cities policy, and um, they were willing to work with us and give a reduced premium, if you will, to add everything so we weren't excluding anything. Um, after review with MMU and then internally, it was determined that there was some locations that were not going to be added. So um, I had sent that information to Cincinnati for an updated quote, and we haven't received it. So, so you're expecting that that quote is going to be closer to or maybe even at the... Similar to the 58,000, right. yeah, correct. So these are like lift stations and other critical infrastructure pieces around Anything town. that would have motors, pumps, compressors, um, yes. A question that I have that's more for council on this is the one thing that I'm a little bit leery about, about jumping on the uh, deductibles is that right now, if we have, if there's something that happens that doesn't meet the deductible, that's part of our department's budget then, correct? We don't have we don't have a deductible fund or a casualty fund in our budget, in our reserves to make that, correct? We actually we actually have an insurance fund that has a, f a small amount of fund balance or cash in it for those ki kinds of occurrences. Is it so? What we would recommend would be that we try to capture those savings, but we don't necessarily lower the budget, but we set some money aside so that as going forward, we, if we have a situation where we have to meet those deductibles, that we have some money already available. Okay. That, that's, and, and thank you. That's where I was headed with this, is that we have our health care savings plan that, that deals with these casualty losses because I'm, I'm all, I mean, you can easily be insurance broke, and then you can also be grossly and tragically underinsured and finding that balance is is tough and we have a good track record so I, I really like the idea of building in our reserves to self-insure those first ones and then insure mo more for the large casualties so I I appreciate that recommendation and and I appreciate the fact that we're in our 10-year history was a big uh, cons considerable factor for staff with that and that we've only um, We've only hit the fifty thousand dollar aggregate once in the last ten years. Right. Okay. Other questions. This what we're doing here is not uncommon. What is going on in public, in general, on insurance? This is very common. I don't want to call it rate sizing, but these larger deductibles, it's just becoming a fact of life because of, I don't know. I don't know. I claim histories. I don't know what it is, but it's it's very becoming very common. And the insurance industry, as Joe will tell you, is, it, I don't want to say it's a mess, but right now it's very much in flux. Yeah, just to give a little bit more background, too, um, I know a couple of years ago when we were uh, considering working with North Risk Partners, um, there was a remarket process that happened, and the previous agent was not able to find anything else uh, that would be better in coverage or cheaper in coverage than what the League of Minnesota City provides. So in no way, shape, or form would I recommend moving from the league for any property or casualty lines of business um, because their rates are strong and they know what they're doing. But to Jim's point, um, the property market is extremely hard right now. And so in order to curb some of the cost, deductible increases sure. are a way to do that. And, I, and I'm good with that as long as we can, you know, I think it's it's credible for us to do that, to set up those those balances in reserves to 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 self-insure more of the of the smaller things and then have the the large catastrophe things i think back to when we had the issue at the the arena unfortunately that wasn't covered 
but uh, those budget hits are tough on departments. And you know, when you think about what our what our levy is, you know, we're now going to be more than one percent of our levy in responsibility for large loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember the arena would have fell under the equipment breakdown insurance policy too, not the League of Minnesota policy. Right, that's the boiler insurance, and and right. and, we, and we missed. Yeah. We shouldn't. I mean, my opinion, they, but we missed. And we did. So we did miss, and so we paid that ourselves, which mm -hmm. is very painful. Other questions for Mr. Larson? So, if the if this is approved this evening, it would be with the understanding that the um, Cincinnati insurance coverage for equipment breakdown that the council will get an update on what that actual number is. Correct. Okay. With that, is there any other questions? I make a motion we approve. Second. By Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? Mr. Mayor, the, the only thing I have is if we approve it and it does not come in significantly lower, then are we obligated to pay because we approved? Or should we wait until we have all the numbers? Well, I would amend my motion that we approve the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance because Cincinnati's the boiler insurance is a complete separate policy, correct? Correct. So I'd make we approve the first, and then at, but that October 1st our insurance comes due. We don't have another meeting before October 1st. Yeah, and it won't be a problem for Cincinnati if this comes in after the fact. Okay. We can still bind. Then I would amend my motion that we approve the first part of the insurance, and then the October meeting we can take a look at the boiler insurance. So, and, and that's okay with the second? And that would include the LMCIT coverage as well as the Illinois casualty coverage as the liquor liability. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So everything except for the Cincinnati okay. insurance coverage for equipment breakdown, and that will come back at the next regular council meeting. Perfect. Okay. Any other? Everybody understands the revised motion. Any other discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We'll move then to the uh, next agenda. And well, first off, thank you, Carla and EJ and Joel, for your work on this. Thank you. Thanks. Agenda item number 19 is the update on the Marshall Aquatic Center and specifically the uh, uh, sales tax report that was uh, recently um, conducted. I'm going to call first on Sharon Hansen, City Administrator. Okay. So in the packet was a recent study that was completed by the U University of Minnesota Extension. And uh, we did contract with the University of Minnesota to give us more updated numbers on local option sales tax, which that's where you see the acronym LOST, and uh, who pays what uh, in terms of resident versus non-resident. So. Uh, the study was actually conducted by Eric King. He is not able to present this tonight. Uh, so you'll see there that um, some of the slides are University of Minnesota, and I did note where the city of Marshall did add some data. The sales tax, um, even though in simplistic forms we know what we collect, we, we know what it uh, goes to pay for specifically with a half percent. There's a lot of different exemptions. Uh, there's hundreds of pages of guidelines on who pays what and when. Um, and so we're not gonna get into a lot of great detail, uh, except for if you do have questions, we can certainly uh, dig through it. In the actual report, which is in your uh, packet, uh, there is some forecasts on future sales tax collections in aggregate and also in different categories. So what the study did is actually looked at total sales tax collected in the state and then took uh, income uh, levels from the city of the Marshall and the county to figure out what would be paid for by resident and non-resident. And again, we didn't include a lot of, of the data in the slides. There's about 11 slides we're gonna cover tonight um, because even on a statewide basis, it doesn't necessarily mean it is true for the city of Marshall. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So that uh, kind of covers that slide. Um, next slide. 
So why did we um, um, look at this study uh, once again? And I, I really like this particular paragraph out of the report. And we've had a little discussion about why are we looking at the sales tax? And this goes back uh, really to 2020 and how best to pay for the aquatic center. And we really felt the most effective way in the governing body, the city council agreed with that, is to look at the sales tax. We had success with that with Red Baron and Merritt. And we also looked at what the impact of property taxes would be if we did not look at um, providing the aquatic center revenue through sales tax. And it would have been painful. We, we currently estimated it'd be a 20% levy increase if we were gonna make uh, the revenue uh, bond payments through property taxes versus the sales tax. The other thing that uh, sometimes gets brought up between property tax and sales tax, and actually this is one of the reasons the legislature is looking at sales tax currently, is how regressive is sales tax in comparison to property tax? And this study makes a statement that uh, really the property tax can be more regressive because it doesn't look at income. And, it, and the way that Minnesota has sales tax, of course, most of you know it excludes the basic necessities of food and clothing. So it's less regressive than some other states. And in this report's opinion, less regressive than property tax. And then uh, we did have, again, some survey data uh, that showed support for the sales tax. So I think the analysis by Council Baker Tilly and having uh, some initial <coughs> survey helps support us looking in the direction of sales tax. Next slide. So uh, you may have heard or statistics before about how many workers come into the city of Marshall. Uh, this is a really good um, um, image of uh, telling us the actual statistics. So we have over 6,400 workers that come into the city of Marshall uh, daily to work. Uh, we have a smaller number uh, that exits uh, to go work elsewhere outside the city and that's at the 2,200 level and then 4,500 uh, or approximately stay in the city. So uh, about 10,000 jobs. And so you'll see in the report as well that this really uh, helps with our sales tax collection revenue, but it also increases that non-resident spending. Uh, one of the things that was noted uh, in the report that if people work in a community, they're likely to shop and get their goods and services from the community they work in. And certainly um, we have seen that in some of our sales tax collection and again, identified in this report. Uh, we do have a comparison from um, 2012 uh, to 2021. So our sales tax that's currently in existence at a half percent was approved by referendum in 2012. The first collection started in April of 2013. So I think to use these two data points is really uh, beneficial. And from 2012 to currently, we've had a, seen a $45 million um, dollar increase in total taxable sales. Some of the areas, and you'll see this on a later um, slide where we've seen some increases uh, more dramatically is building materials, furniture sales, and actually eating and drinking establishments have seen uh, a greater increase. Uh, leasing uh, sales, uh, I think, is another one that's noted. We, we have uh, several businesses that do equipment leasing, and, and that also helps our sales tax collection. Next slide. Uh, I stated earlier that the University of Minnesota uh, did some forecasting. Again, they used the, some of the uh, state total sales tax collected and did some, e some income um, calculations to get to what is it going to look like for the city of Marshall. Um, we've already had Baker Tilly do a uh, forecast uh, on revenue potential collection because we have to do a bonding schedule if the aquatic center is approved. So we have to kind of know what's our capacity to, to uh, capture sales tax. So I think this chart really uh, lends well. It gives you a lower end, which is 1.5 million and an upper uh, level of 2 million. And uh, so to be safe in the middle or 1.8. When we look back at the bonding schedule for the aquatic center, again, if this is approved, the initial year is 1.7 for a bond, 1.7 million for a bond payment from sales tax. And at uh, the end of the 20 year, you're at 2 million. So uh, this is beneficial to have this and this was shared with uh, Baker Tilly as well. 
Next slide. This uh, actually just gives you an image of uh, their projections of where it could be. And again, playing it safe, we're looking at uh, 1.8 on an annual basis. Next slide. We did uh, present, this is City of Marshall data. It was not in the University of Minnesota report. But just to give you a look back on how our sales collections have um, come through the city, uh, and really the largest increase from 2020 to 2021. And uh, even in 2023, uh, we projected out, we thus far have collected up until June, and uh, it looks favorable in terms of meeting some of the projections by University of Minnesota, and it looks uh, favorable again for that funding source for Aquatic Center if it is approved. Uh, next slide. One of the things that we really want to hone in on, and we thought it was beneficial for the council to get the report and also uh, review some of these slides, is the amount of um, sales tax paid for by resident versus non-residents. And uh, we're actually planning on uh, releasing a press release um, likely tomorrow that kind of highlights this fact because it's different than uh, what we've seen in the past. And I've got a slide after this and that kind of details that. Um, I did mention before some of the categories where we're seeing um, some increases, building materials, general merchandise. So the general merchandise has been characterized in the, in the industry codes put out by the state as department stores. And one may not think we have a lot, but I do believe runnings in Walmart uh, probably do pull in a lot in terms of, of sales tax. So we don't have specific in um, sales tax business receipts uh, that a lot of this is private data and that does not get shared, but we can kind of equate from our own local uh, knowledge of the economic base in terms of where we're seeing some of these categories. I want to make a mention on eating and dining. Um, we said that sales tax excludes uh, basic necessities of food and clothing. Some of the clothing are not um, are taxable. Uh, sporting good clothing, for example, some um, um, personal protective equipment, some cell phone accessories that might be uh, seen as uh, an accessory to clothing. Those are all taxable. And then if food is prepared, it's also a taxable item. So it contributes to our sales tax, general sales tax collection. So. Again, lots of guidelines and lots of, lots of um, um, references that the state puts out to what is exempt and what is not exempt. Next slide. Uh, actually, in 2012, uh, when we did an estimate of what did the resident pay and what did the non-resident pay, uh, it was actually almost flipped. Um, so the resident, it was estimated at that time, um, paid 60% of the sales tax collected versus the non-resident of 40%. This was actually found in presentations that were uh, given on Red Baron and Merritt at the time. And I don't know, uh, Mr. Mayor, did you, was there a University of Minnesota study or was there some just estimating internally by finance staff to get that? I, I wasn't aware, I didn't see the study. So. There was not the detailed study that uh, was conducted this year. Okay. The sales tax study was not conducted prior. So it was based on, on estimates and, you know, so. Yeah. So. Anyway, we uh, think we're doing really well in, in, in terms of uh, bringing in uh, outside revenue from those non-residents, non which all further supports um, not looking at the, the property tax. And then the final slide, I think this is also really important to note. When we were talking to the legislature about uh, sales tax collection, the, the discussion about who pays for what, non-resident residents, should there be revenue sharing? Uh, we know that there's one other community that does that, but that wouldn't have really worked well for the city of Marshall, frankly, because it, it wouldn't have been able to make the bond payments. But I think another reason why um, we have to look at um, the importance of non-residents helping pay for this, they are, um, they're, um, it's a regional facility and they're using the facility, but the city, of Marshall still responsible for maintenance and any capital improvements for over the life of the project. So while they may pay for majority of the sales tax, the city still has some burden, if not a lot of burden in terms of maintaining the facility. Um, we've 
seen that with um, a little bit with Red Baron and some of the capital. We did get a legal opinion uh, actually on use of sales tax for capital versus using food, beverage, and lodging, uh, I think about three or four years ago as well. So even though non-residents may contribute more, uh, the city also has uh, an equal or greater chance of, or a burden of actually supporting the facility after it's done. I wanna state that some of our earlier presentations, we estimated um, the annual sales tax paid for by a resident. And again, this new report will help us update some of our presentation, but we estimated originally $70 per person. Now with these uh, new statistics, it's actually $45 per person paid for uh, in sales tax to help support a half percent sales tax, whether it be for Red Baron or Merit or the Aquatic Center if it is approved. So just thought I wanted to share the information. Again, there's no action, um, but giving you some background on this, and I know the mayor uh, has a lot of experience with sales tax and given a lot of presentations, and uh, he may have some opinions on it too. And EJ, if I missed anything, please add, so. Well, Sharon, I think you covered it really quite thoroughly. You, there may be some questions, but I think the, you know, kind of the bottom line is that you know, 65, 66% of the sales tax generated in the city of Marshall comes from people who do not live in the city of Marshall, but that's consistent with uh, Marshall as a regional center. This is where people come for it, from the region for not only retail activity, but also for employment. And the city has, has uh, costs associated with uh, providing the infrastructure that's necessary for those employers, the transportation system that's necessary, the all of the other things that go along with being a, a regional center. So this is really um, good data, and I think it's uh, you know good to have a kind of factual-based uh, uh, data that can be made available to the public so the public ultimately can make a very informed decision when they vote on, on the referendum question. <clears throat> Any questions or other input? Okay, Craig, nothing? Well, I just, you know, I'll echo what, what's already been said. This is a great option, in my opinion, for this project. It's worked very well for Merit and for Red Baron Arena and Expo. And I think it's the absolute right fit for what we're, what we're proposing to do with the Aquatic Center. I'm not a big tax fan, but the legislature in Minnesota got this right when they put this option together and they made it available to regional center communities to, to ask for and get permission to put it in front of, in front of their constituents. Um, you know, the county has it also, they don't have to go for a referendum like we do, but um, it works as effectively for them also for their road and bridge fund projects when they need that. So um, it's a great tool. I appreciate the fact that we've been approved I regret and feel bad that it didn't happen earlier when we originally asked, but we've got it now. And, and I really hope that, that our, our voters look at it and, and, uh, and agree and, and find their support for it, because I think this is a really, really good way to fund our, our proposed project. Thank you, Craig. Any other input, comments? If not, then we will move then to um, Commission Board Liaison Reports, Craig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, personnel Committee met earlier uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and of course we took action on that item. And then uh, we also met with the PINT again this afternoon, early evening, and we took action on that also. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, Steve. Um, adult Community Center did not meet, Cable Commission hasn't met, and EDA did meet, but I was unable to attend because I was late with work and then I couldn't get on line. So I'll defer that to Amanda. Amanda. I'll, I'll try to cover EDA. Um, Main Street revitalization grants are still being considered by Minnesota, Mindeed yet. Um, so they've all been, all but four of applications have been sent on and we're waiting now to hear back on approval. Um, EDA is considering a few ideas for helping the development of the hotel out by the ice arena. Um, nothing's been finalized there, just some conversation. Um, 
quick trip, obviously you can see it has broken ground and has made a lot of progress very quickly. Um, and then just some more cool talk about daycare and there's interest in the community in opening a daycare center actually S several um, people are interested in opening centers. So looking at options there. Great. Any questions for Amanda? If not, from the Southwest Regional Development Commission, they had their monthly meeting in, um, in Lakefield uh, this last week. The, um, um, there's been a lot of staff turnover at the, um, uh, for a variety of reasons with Southwest Regional Development Commission. So within the last year, I believe, C, there's seven. C was also at the meeting. There is uh, seven new staff, and they are now uh, uh, fully staffed, so that's a really good thing. John. See? Um, with the Convention Visitors Bureau, they, um, um, Preston came in and talked about the Aquatic Center, so there was a lot of support for that. Um, so thank you, Preston, for coming in and talking about that. We had a really long meeting because of you, so but it's okay. It was a good, it was a good presentation. Um, and then uh, they were just gearing up for uh, Prairie Jam was, was, uh, was this past Thursday, and they didn't have rain, so that was success. And that's all I have. And Jim? I have nothing. We'll move then to council member individual items, Jim. Yeah, I have nothing. C? Nothing. John? Craig? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> um, I don't know how many people knew uh, Mayor Dave uh, Smegliski from Granite Falls, um, but he passed away Friday evening in Washington, D.C., and I'd like to just take a little bit and, and uh, read some highlights that were in the West Central Tribune uh, yesterday regarding SMEG. I had the privilege of working with SMEG with my previous employee with the state through three of the city's disasters and uh, he was a tireless leader in Granite Falls and he's going to be sorely missed but he also along with our mayor served some some pretty high roles and and with vision and, and dedication to the region so Real quickly, what it says here is a small western Minnesota community has lost its mayor and tireless advocate who led it through three major natural disasters. Granite Falls Mayor Dave Smigleski, age 70, died Friday evening in Washington, D.C. Family members reported on Monday. He had been diagnosed about three years earlier with ALS, and he was in the nation's capital attending events as part of the Southwest Corridor Coalition seeking highway funding for his community. Former manager Bill Lavin, who I also had the privilege of working with through those disasters, made a real good comments about, about Mayor Smeg is that the community couldn't be the way it is without him. Um, through his 31-year tenure as city manager, Lavin described him as articulate, kind, knowledgeable, wonderful to work with, and with a great sense of humor, a wonderful leader. Smeg did serve in government since 1979. He was appointed at age 26 to a vacancy on the city council. Then he took the duties of mayor in 96 with the death of Mayor Roy Lenzen and has served continuously in that role. So uh, he was in the 97 floods and then the, uh, in 97 and 2001 and then again in the 2000 tornado that destroyed more than 100 homes. Um, just a significant guy, good guy. We're going to miss him. God rest in, rest in peace, Smag. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? I've got nothing. Amanda. <clears throat> okay. We'll move then to staff reports. Sharon. Uh, yeah, just a little bit on the Aquatic Center. We're actually doing um, some events at coffee shops in early October. I'll send you the, the notice on that, but we're taking an hour and just opening us ourselves up to any uh, residents that might have questions, any suggestions, and uh, we're calling it kind of a coffee conversation hour, um, specific to the Aquatic Center, but I suppose other people could mention something else as well. So uh, if you're interested, um, certainly can attend. Uh, we're a month and a week away from um, the November 7th uh, vote, so. Uh, we'll be participating in the uh, SMSU Homecoming Parade as well. We'll probably do some paid advertisements. And uh, I think I think the Marshall Independent will uh, do a little more in-depth story, too. Uh, we've given uh, the reporter a lot of information, and uh, hopefully there's some, some good coverage on that as well. 
So far, uh, absentee balloting has been relatively slow, uh, but I think um, to be expected um, with the timing and uh, that being the only uh, question on the ballot as well. Did attend the League of Minnesota Cities board meeting last week. Uh, it was more of a retreat, but um, really good information shared. I know I shared this with some of the council members. It's nice to see um, what other cities are doing for uh, levy increases, even though they're not totally comparable to the city of Marshall and the same population, things like that. But uh, most of the cities in that uh, room were over 10% for levy increases. And uh, other topics kind of shared um, were, were a lot alike, even though there's, again, a different population. Some of the same issues affects um, all of us. So good to get together with them. And then uh, I probably should have the EDA director comment on this, but um, I'm going to state that we still think Marshalls is coming to Marshall. Um, we have been in contact with Woodcrest Capital, the owner of the property. Uh, they've done some additional transactions. So I know that's a question that's kind of out there because it wasn't clear in the newspaper article really about Marshalls. Um, but we're still confident on Marshalls and, uh, again, Woodcrest Crest Capital has done uh, some additional work in that area. So don't have a timeline, but we're still working with them. So that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Any questions for Sharon? If not, Jason? I'll be extremely brief. Uh, construction projects are getting very close. We're inching to the finish line here. So I can answer questions if we have them, but I've got nothing more to report. Any questions for Jason? I don't have a question, just a comment. I've driven down the new 3rd Street and Lion Street, and it does flow. It looks nice. I think we should be proud of the meetings we did. It turned out well over the two or three years that we worked on getting that project, and it is really taking shape, and it's looking like a very good, usable, positive space that hopefully gets used next year uh, quite greatly. My wife and I have walked it a few times, too, and it's, it's really nice. It's very enjoyable. Very good. Thank you. We'll move then to the remainder of the agenda items, then, which include the uh, minutes from the public housing, uh, commission from July, the listing of building permits, uh, and the listing of upcoming meetings. Is there anything else to come forward uh, from the council at this meeting? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? By John, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Jim to adjourn discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll, we'll close. We'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>